Um, to speed things up, I would just say that we've got a fantastic panel. Their biogs are in the brochure, uh, and you can see that they're Euro stars in the world of uh, <clears throat> gene and cell therapy to do with the eye from both ends of the Eurostar, two of the three ends of the Eurostar, Paris and London, and I hope we'll be able to uh, take you through why so many of the companies we've just seen have put a picture of the eye in their um, presentations. By way of introduction, uh, I'm from the BIA, the UK Trade Association for UK Biotech. I'm delighted to be part of this, and I think we're uh, really, uh, <clears throat> we've got a vibrant community of member companies in cell and gene therapy, and it's interesting for me to see our expert committees, uh, chaired by Chris Mason at UCL, uh, interacting with our regulatory committee on issues like ATMPs and increasingly with our manufacturing committee through uh, Stephen Ward and the Cell Therapy Catapult. It's interesting how much of this is becoming an engineering discussion and a regulatory discussion as well as a science discussion. I think that bodes well for where we're going. But with no further ado, I'm going to drive straight in and start by asking my panel to explain why are we talking about the eye. And there could be no better person to introduce that than Pete Coffey um, from UCL. Pete. Thank you. Do you, to, do you want to speak from here or do you want to... No, I'll, I'll go for okay. it. It'll be easy. Um, why the eye? Easy. There's some huge, massive, unmet clinical need in two factions of the eye. One is a large population and one is an orphan indication. So for business actually to come into this area, not only is there profit there in terms of being able to invest, there's also uh, regulatory issues which can be addressed in terms of small biotech as well. So again, to allow discussion, why uh, ophthalmology in Europe? Um, probably because two major institutions have invested heavily in this. This is UCL and Moorfields Eye Hospital and the Cannes Van and the Vision Research Institute in Paris, which is led by um, Sahel here, Professor Sahel. Um, we both have major um, uh, industry collaborations the Institute and Moorfields has a major collaboration and ongoing now uh, for five years with GSK. I myself also have a collaboration with Pfizer, which has allowed us to go forward with a stem cell trial. So why again the eye? The eye is a small organ. It's amenable to manipulation for placing uh, genes into it without affecting other components in the body. Equally, in terms of that surgical intervention, again, it's important that actually placing cells in the eye is a relatively simple procedure. But equally, the endpoints which we can govern to establish both safety and efficacy, once again, are very simple in the eye. And the concerns which the regulators have, they are concerns and rightfully concerned, but there are ones which we can achieve very easily within the clinical setting. So the eye is a good place to do this. Companies are willing to invest early within this field. Both the Institute and Moorfields and the Cannes Van are attracting business into our own institutions, not only using our own uh, platforms and uh, potential therapeutics, but also in developing other companies, etc. So actually ophthalmology is a big area and rebranding products which have already been inhuman but not actually looked at in their possibility of therapeutics in the, uh, in the eye. And then finally, new platforms are arising and opportunities with cells, specifically induced pluripotent stem cells. We now have banks of patient cells which we can test therapeutics on and even screen for therapeutics. Our first paper just came out on a orphan indication where we were using read-through to actually establish um, or re-establish uh, protein expression in a ver very rare organ disease. So I would say the eye is achieving a lot within uh, uh, cell therapy and gene therapy because of the infrastructure which is here within Europe. It's Europe which is making a big difference. Even CIRM, who has its three billion, has a fragmented ophthalmology approach, where it's trying to draw institutes together in a similar way to Moorfields and um, the Cannes van. Pete, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I suppose if we've got Pete and Jose Alain as representatives of the uh, expert bases within uh, London and Paris, um, uh, I, and is I hope that you, I'd have you here as a representative of a real vibrant new biotech in uh, the UK, uh, working in the ophthalmology space. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about 
Night Stars, where you've come from and what you're doing. Thanks, Steve. Um, so Night Star is a, a great example of how academia can interface with the venture capital world and really um, bring a technology forward into the development phase and hopefully ultimately uh, to patients. Um, it star Night Star started off uh, at the beginning of this year and really is a culmination of work being done by Professor Robert McLaren at the University of Oxford. Uh, and uh, this, uh, coupled with the insight from the Wellcome Trust and its uh, independent subsidiary, Synchrona, uh, the merger of those two finally um, uh, emerged out of that, uh, the company called Nightstar. So we're a small biotech company. We're a gene therapy retinal disease uh, company uh, focusing primarily uh, at the AAV platform and looking at choroideremia. Uh, and choroideremia is, a, is, a, is an orphan disease, a rare genetic disorder, uh, X-linked disorder, about 1 in 50,000 uh, in terms of the occurrence. Um, and this is a disease which is a blinding disease. There, there's really no cure there for patients. Uh, patients normally perceive um, uh, symptoms even in their early teenage years. Uh, patients complain of uh, dim vision, night vision problems. Um, their peripheral vision starts to cave in. And as the years move on, um, progressively, uh, re progressively the, the vision, visual fields shrink such that ultimately by the time the patient gets into the 40s and 50s, their central vision even goes. Um, so this is really a, a real disease in the sense that you know, teenagers will not want to go out in the evenings with their friends because they bump into things. They, they, they seem to be clumsy. Uh, they, can't they can't be able to be savvy with their friends. Um, you know, I, was, I was speaking to a patient with choroideremia at Moorfields recently, um, and this was a parent uh, who was giving some advice to his uh, young child and saying to the young child that, um, the only piece of advice I'd give you is to marry early. Um, and the reason for that is that you want to be able to see your grandchildren, at least, before you go blind. And that's quite sobering to think about that, that that's the, that's the lesson that the parent is giving to the child, that, you know, try and marry early because, you know what, by the time you have uh, children, I will not be able to see them because there is really no treatment for this disease. So this is what we're working on. So, you know, we're trying to cure this disease. Um, uh, Robert McLaren has, has done some early work, very promising results. They've been published in the Lancet paper, um, six patients out of a cohort of 12 that he's treated, um, and uh, out of nine patients and, and three more to be treated still. Uh, this is, uh, the treatment has gone out to two years. Very promising early data in terms of improvement in visual acuity, uh, never mind halting the progression of the disease. Uh, and so we feel very enthusiastic about you know, one, the gene therapy area, and two, ophthalmology. Uh, and as Pete Kofi said earlier, that, you know, the eye is a, is, is a relatively immune-privileged site. And I think that really lends itself well to this kind of therapy. And, of course, from a choroideremia point of view, the advantage there for us is that it's a monogenetic disease. Uh, it's a disease where there's one gene defect, and we're trying to repair that gene defect surgically by putting in the, 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 the by replacing the faulty gene with the, with the correct gene. So, you know, we're, we're at the stage where we've got a great team together and uh, we're moving into our pivotal trials, hopefully, uh, later this year, uh, sorry, into next year. And um, uh, we're looking to um, uh, really capitalize on the, on the um, confidence that Sincona have given in us. And he's, <coughs> thank, thank you very much. And <coughs> if I can turn now to Soraya, um, it was interesting to see um, the Sanofi uh, praised by Oxford Biomedica in the, uh, the previous panel. And I know that uh, <coughs> as a global player, You've got uh, significant uh, moves in the gene therapy in this space. Perhaps you could tell us the global pharma perspective and particularly why gene therapy is the thing that you've looked at. So, uh, first, thank you for the invitation. So, indeed, it started uh, with our collaboration with Oxford Bi Biomedica that lasted uh, uh, five years. Uh, it was a co-development uh, partnership around uh, several ocular gene therapy programs, and we have uh, last year, uh, uh, in licensed uh, the the two uh, Ustad and Star and Ustad and Stargen for to uh, to treat two two rare diseases, two rare inherited retinal degenerative disorders, uh, Stargard disease and Usher disease. So those programs are right now in clinical stage. We are moving from the phase one dose escalation safety part into the uh, <coughs> efficacy or biological activity part. Um, and we are really looking forward now um, advancing those programs because we are reaching an interesting stage where we will have the clinical readouts. We know from the animal <laughs> experiments uh, that are being held uh, here and there uh, around the world and uh, indeed uh, 
the UK and France with these two institutions are very well represented, um, that the gene replacement approach offers uh, promises uh, for patients. And if those projects, including with uh, others' choridemia trial and the liver congenital uh, amaurosis type 2 from Spark Therapeutics, um, are now really leading the way. So uh, we feel that it's, it's an opportunity to, to be there to address a high unmet medical need that cannot be addressed by any other approach. And uh, I'll let the expert expand on that. And we are also reaching a stage where the field has matured uh, enough to, to give us this opportunity to test this uh, first generation of products. Uh, and uh, hopefully we at Sanofi, we, we are very much excited to uh, put on the table our uh, clinical development and the regulatory and as well CMC expertise to address all the, the challenges uh, that are ahead and that will make these promises become a reality for patients. And there are more than 200 different retinal uh, inherited degenerative disorders that may benefit from uh, such gene therapy approach. Thank you. And we heard a little bit this morning from Novartis about their approach being that you need to work in a different way in a different partnership style in this space. Is, would that reflect your experience in Sanofi as well? Well, this is exactly what happened to us indeed with our collaboration with also Biomedica. I think um, the, the, this uh, field is, uh, we are, the pharma is less familiar with the gene and cell therapy, and I think our collaboration with Oxford Medica has led us to, to grow into the space. We have also um, uh, enhanced our internal expertise in this field, especially with uh, our Genzyme colleagues joining us and their expertise in rare diseases. So um, that's how we ended up at this stage. Thank you, and I'm delighted you, did, you touched on my alma mater, because I used to be, I'm a former Genzymer, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, matrix autologous chondrocyte implant and, uh, and other uh, challenges are ones that uh, scar me or mm. give me the experience for, for, for working in this space. Mm. Um, uh, if I can perhaps turn now to Professor Sahal, delighted that you're with us. Um, uh, I wonder, uh, from your perspective, um, uh, maybe I'll ask you the first question I asked ask Pete. Um, why is the eye the, 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 place to, the place to look, and um, how is it from your perspective? Well, first, because obviously, like everyone knows, the, the gift of sight is so precious that uh, blinding diseases are a nightmare for all of us, and uh, trying to address that is, of course, important for ophthalmologists, but for everyone. Also, because there are so many diseases which are still unmet needs and are really waiting for solutions, especially monogenic disorders and also aging disorders like age-related macular degeneration. The second thing is, as Pete explained, is that the eye is a very special organ because it's accessible. It's also secluded from a lot of immune responses, although not uh, totally protected from that, but at least uh, less prone to get immune responses. But the most important thing is that we are able to observe what we do very precisely. The surgery is very precise, but also the monitoring of the effects of the treatment and the selection of patients is very accurate. We have high resolution imaging. We now reach the cellular level in a non-invasive manner which is the best way to know beforehand how many cells are still alive, how many cells are functional or prone to become functional after treatment, and then to monitor the effects after treatment. So this leads to a wealth of data which are being gained from very few patients, and this is very important for the safety phase because we can monitor any side effect, but also later on when we get to the efficiency phase, we can really detect any effect in this patient and learn for the next phases of the, of the trials. Thank you. And I'm going to come to the audience very soon because I'm keen to make sure that you've got the opportunity to ask the expert questions, which would be beyond me. But it seems to me, if I can, uh, if I can paraphrase, that what we've got in ophthalmology is we have a couple of very big hospitals and scientific institutes where you have a very large number of patients organised against uh, UCL and more fields or very similar in, in Paris. So if we're thinking about engineering and scale up, there's some sort of efficiencies that are already built in there. There's simplicity in trial design and some straightforward um, <coughs> uh, signals on safety and efficacy, which make the, the research and development process more straightforward. Plus, there is the compelling need for, um, uh, for, uh, for therapies in this area. Have I got it at the most basic level? I'm looking for nods. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. So let's have some let's have some expert questions from the, the from the audience, please. I, I'm keen to make sure that we have an opportunity for you to get to, uh, your, your questions as to the state of uh, the state of ophthalmology and cell and gene therapy. So questions from anybody at this stage. If not, you'll go back to my uh, Chris at the front. I'm really 
interested in the, in the blockbuster therapies that are potentially here. Um, we see the science moving forward nicely. We see the big pharma companies coming in. The question is, is the infrastructure there? So let's say AMD is, uh, gets an approval or RP gets an approval. Um, these are big numbers of patients we could potentially treat here. Have we got the clinics, the clinicians, the trained people, the resources to actually put these therapies in? Um, so <laughs> I'll answer that, Chris. <laughs> um, so the answer is yes and no. So we have, I would say, probably enough clinical involvement in the types of surgeries which may be necessary. And part of the evidence of that is the way in which the NHS has responded to Lucentis clinics. They're a huge number. We will have to add to that, and we will have to, have to add an expertise to it. But I think what is going to be of more concern, and I think is the direction you're going, is can we actually deliver the cells to the clinic? And the answer is not in the numbers we need at the moment, definitely not. To give an example, there's 700,000 patients who could potentially benefit from um, an RPE patch. Now, that patch isn't very big. It's only by three by six millimetres. But there's 100,000 cells have to go on each of those patches. Um, would the UK be able to manufacture those at a sensible rate at this moment in time? And the answer is no. But that's where there's opportunity. And obviously... You know, one of the reasons why Catapult itself was set up. And in fact, we're working with uh, a Japanese company now who are robotically producing patches. And they may be able to, with one machine which would fit on this stage, which astounds me, produce 17,000 patches at a very reasonable price. So I think... As with any therapeutic, and as we saw with the various presentations for the immunotherapies, there's still investment which should be made, and there is still businesses to be created which will allow us to do it. I don't think it's... I think the important thing is, is it achievable? And the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, Jose, Alain, perhaps um, we, we heard this morning from, from Kieran about... Uh, from GE about the next challenge for this sector to be standardization, industrialization, if you like, of approach. Are there thoughts on that from, from, from your institute? Well, the, the main thought is really that uh, we have to make sure that there are enough trained surgeons able to perform properly the type of surgery which is needed, especially for cell therapy and even for gene therapy, if we get into the subretinal space, because we're, it's very promising. We get very nice initial results, but you need to standardize that. And this is ongoing, and also this, uh, there is an increasing appetite for that. Actually, the Lucenti stories and the idea stories is bringing a lot of people into retina because uh, this is a very advanced stage now in uh, therapy. But uh, when we talk about manufacturing, uh, it's still in infancy, as Pete was saying. Uh, not for gene therapy. So it has improved a lot over the past very few years. So we talked about Oxford Myodi Medica, Geneton, and other facilities in the US. So this is happening now and the samples you need for VR are so small that for gene therapy it's not too much of a concern. For cell therapy uh, we are not yet there, especially we talk about iPS cells where this individualized type of cells, the process to get from these cells to for each individual patient the type of therapy, although the time it takes from when you get the sample to the time you get the product for the patient is still very long. So all of this has to be handled and uh, it's extremely promising. So I think it's worth it. And what I heard to, today about immunotherapies, it shows that even very individuals approached are getting now to patients. So I don't think this is remote from us in ophthalmology, but we are not yet there. Yeah, okay. I, add to that, that, um, I think these uh, comments was very useful. When we, when we talk about blockbuster status, um, within the ophthalmic world, that's nothing new. You know, we've seen the world of Lucentis come through an anti-VEGF ther therapy for wet AMD. And, and we realized as an ophthalmic community, and I know as a clinician, we realized that we needed to suddenly increase our throughput and efficiencies of having intravitreal injections set up in a very efficient manner uh, and have that whole process really streamlined. Uh, and we learned through that process. And I think that as we think forward, as we think about gene therapy and stem cell therapies, you know, I, I think really... Um, it mustn't scare us. It is really an opportunity, like Pete says, for us to be able to embrace that and learn from the past also, that we can actually take on big-scale treatment and set up the infrastructure within the hospital system and the healthcare sector to be able to really provide that service for patients. 
Sorry, I, think what, I think what is his benefit as well, which again, you know, Cat, uh, Catapult has been uh, involved in, is actually the UK has that infrastructure to develop, you know, specifically, as you know yourself, Chris, in terms of the NHS. Um, to be able to do that, I think, is there to be done. Perhaps I can just uh, question to Soraya off the back of that. As well as the challenge of manufacturing and scale up, there's obviously the uh, concerns around pricing, premium pricing. I mean, if we're looking at blockbusters in uh, an area where there are existing products, it's different to an area perhaps like a rare disease where there is absolutely no therapy at the moment. Is that something that's been a concern to you know, a global player like Sanofi? No, I think what, what drives right now, um, uh, well, it, I think the unmet medical need drives whatever we do, and uh, if you develop uh, a product that addresses that unmet medical need and that is being proposed with the uh, at a price that is also acceptable for the healthcare systems, that's the perfect equation where all stakeholders then take take benefit of whatever innovation being put uh, uh, up, uh, forward. Therefore. Um, I think for those blinding diseases for which there is no treatment, um, any uh, approach that will uh, prevent those patients from losing vision and that will stop their disease even at the asymptomatic stage before they start losing it in the second or third decade of life um, will have a value for those patients and will have a value for the healthcare systems because we know <coughs> how much it costs for a society, for a community or a healthcare system to take care of a patient who is blind and who will need help for his uh, daily life and uh, for his uh, professional life as well. So it's a matter of finding the right equation and we don't see that as a, as a problem. Uh, it's uh, Pete Fine, <coughs> oh, sorry, um, Pete Fine from uh, Epidex Capital. Um, what, one question for the panel is to what extent do they think that sort of intravitreal injections will, that, that there's a need to replace them or you sort of see that this is the standard, also the delivery mechanism for, you know, the next decade to come. And if you do think there's a need to replace it, are there particular platforms that you're seeing that you think look particularly exciting? You can just tell me that afterwards. You don't have to say that in front of 100 people. Yeah, well, currently uh, our clinics are overflooded with patients who get injections every month, so we, and we try to space that. One of the competitors of Lucentis was claiming that you could space the injections. It's not really the case, but the results are, are pretty good. So there are a few products coming along which could enable us to get to three months or six months, which is already uh, pretty good for both patients and clinicians and everyone, actually. And as you may know, there are uh, at least two programs in gene therapy, with three programs, actually, which are aiming at delivering long-term inhibition of uh, VGF uh, effects in the eye. So we are waiting for that. What you may wonder is that at some point, you may no longer need the inhibition of VGF or any uh, androgenic drug in the eye. And uh, at this stage, there is no way to reverse the, the treatment. We are not yet at this stage of having a choice about that, but this is, this is coming along, and the initial results are very promising in this area. What may happen is that currently, in the atrophic EMD, which is the other side of the, of the disease. Uh, there is a new treatment which is in, in currently in phase three, which is also relying on intravitreal injections. And this one, uh, if it works, it will increase the load of, uh, of uh, our clinics on how to handle all these patients. I'm not sure we'll be able to produce this type of uh, compound, which is an antibody in a, in, a, in a sustained manner using gene therapy. I guess it's possible. We are not yet there. So uh, this is one of the challenges for the future. Probably a long-term expression using gene therapy would be a nice thing to, to have. The issue will be how to stop the treatment uh, when you don't need it anymore, especially when you have conditions like diabetic retinopathy, not just age-related macular degeneration, where you may not need that type of inhibition forever. Other perspectives? Or should we go to another question? Can, Can I, I just answer that uh, cost question? Just, um, it's an interesting question, which I don't think is going to be an easy one to solve. Um, as an example, we, we actually treated 40 patients and it cost us £160,000. But 16 of those patients actually got good visual benefit for over, 16, uh, for, for over eight years. Now, to keep someone blind, it actually costs you £15,000 a year. This is a one-off therapy. So on day one, you give a therapy, and that patient's good for eight years. We actually saved the NHS £2 million. 
The question is, how much do you actually charge for a single therapy on day one when you don't know exactly how long it's going to last? So I don't think there is a good cost model at the moment um, within cell therapies and also gene therapies. So those patients have had eight years good vision, which actually cost us £5,000 per patient. But how much would you charge for that? I have no idea. Any? Yeah, I just want to come back to the individual injection question. I think that's very interesting, and I want to add to what Jose was saying. That, uh, of course, the reason why we put an individual injection in the site where it is is that really we want the drug to disseminate in that area. So usually there's a problem in that area. Now, for example, some of the gene therapy and stem cell therapies are really more directed towards the cells at the back of the eye. And putting a drug within the vitreous cavity may not serve that need and may cause undue side effects. And therefore, we have to develop newer techniques of getting those drugs right to the back of the eye. So it isn't so much a replacement of intravitreal therapy, really. It, it's a question of delivering your, 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 uh, your drug to the target tissues where you want to deliver it, uh, like a laser-guided missile, so that you cause minimal peripheral uh, side effects and, and safety issues, and yet have the efficacy that you need at the site itself. We have another question. Yeah. Yes, I was wondering if you could comment on what can be learned from Provange in terms of pricing and in terms of administration. Uh, this is in the context of Dendrion having filed for bankruptcy on the 10th of November. I'll pass that on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll pass that as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I cannot comment specifically. What, what is clear is that uh, I've seen that already for projections of the pricing of several uh, products which are now being developed, uh, artificial retina or uh, gene therapy for some blinding conditions where we are involved in uh, the development. And uh, usually when you talk about the cost of blindness, just the medical cost, not even talking about the social, social cost, if you think that your therapy is going to be effective for 10 years, you are already uh, with a very good pricing. But the issue is how to convince the authorities that uh, the pocket which is paying for that is the same one that is paying for the social cost, for example. And this is, at least in my country, not possible, uh, and maybe in many countries. So we have to, to view that as a, as a global problem and uh, as a global solution. I, I, I too don't want to comment on the specifics, but I think that there are certainly in the policy world lots of discussions about how you knit these things together, both in terms of the development cycle, early and light scientific advice, which is uh, joint advice with HTA agencies that can ensure that you're at least asking the right questions at an early enough stage to make sure that the product that you're developing um, is going to have a market and, uh, and an approach and the data that's needed to convince the HTA agencies, and I think that they are uh, they are keen to um, be uh, uh, be helpful in this area because of the the strategic importance of gene, gene and cell therapies, and they're certainly getting that from their their bosses on high, certainly in the UK uh, from from where I sit. So I think there's a willingness to do it, and I think if you look at the stuff that the Catapult are doing with Nice to pull together the thinking that can work in this space, and I think if you look at how Nice and Fed to examine this and be and, and share. There are new ways in which some of these questions can be posed um, uh, in a way that perhaps weren't there uh, when uh, original thinking was done uh, a few years ago. Uh, other thoughts? Any, any other questions? At the back. I guess I can yell. I am uh, Raul Saragas for the Center for Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine here, similar to Catapult based in Canada. My question is, um, we work a lot with We also understand that the eye, you know, it has a lot of advantages, and some of the most advanced cell, cell therapies are happening in the eye. So forgive the pun, but why are they being so myopic and looking at small molecule uh, applications when the eye seems to have so much promise for cell therapies? Are, are we missing something? No, you know, um, I think the obvious answer is it's the easiest path. So if you're wanting to actually go down a path where you're actually creating a cell therapy, it's a lot more complex. If you're actually using cells 
as a way of screening a library of uh, therapeutics that's relatively simple and very useful. Don't get me wrong, we're doing it. Um, so it's not myopic, it's just, it's just um, financially it's a cheaper way of doing it and it's also one way of actually gaining um, financial benefit more quickly. So I, I would say they're just edging their bets towards um, the small biologics. The problem is within the eye, there are certain diseases where small biologics just won't work because the cell that you're interested in doesn't exist anymore, it's dead. So, you know, you will have to replace that cell. So, you know, where we've taken the decision is to work on both projects. And in fact, placed an, a, a greater emphasis on cell replacement and cell regeneration as opposed to um, screening drugs. Did you want to come in on that? No, I think, uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons also is that uh, ES cells are, can be a generic approach for con different conditions, but IPS, as I said, the process is very long. If you look at the clinical trial which is taking place in Japan currently, between the time they got the skin sample from the patient and the time they got to the patient, it took several months. So I don't think when you talk to investors about this type of approach for uh, the process from one individual patient, how many facilities you will need to get a GMP facility to prepare all of these cells, and uh, how are you going to explain to the patient how much time it takes. So I think this is a process which is going to happen, but uh, you need some uh, daring uh, enthusiasm to, to get into that, and this is coming along. Also, we many centers, including ours, we develop a, a way to shorten the process say, very significantly which is also a good way to, to get to that. Technology will help a lot in that. I hope Sanofi had this discussion. So I think it contributes to building up the ecosystem. And the same analogy can be made between these two approaches, uh, using cells as a screening assay or as a cell therapy versus what can be done with gene therapy approach, either as an in vivo gene replacement uh, therapy versus using um, gene-based uh, transfer, uh, sorry, um, gene transfer, ex vivo gene transfer of, of, uh, um, of cells that are being then uh, reinfused into patients. It's the other half of the cake for the cell therapy. Probably time for one last question if anyone in the audience has one. If not, I'm going to think, ask, <coughs> ask the panel. Um, what do you think is hot at the moment? What do you think has moved in the last 12 months? What do you think is going to move in this space in the, in the next period of time? Uh, shall we go this way and see how we go? So what do you think is moved? We'll get the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Well, it's very interesting, Steve, that um, having been to the international eye meetings for many, many years now, uh, maybe for the last decade, 15, 20 years even, all we've been hearing about is monoclonal antibodies, anti-VEGF therapy. And of course, that's very, very big. You know, not to belittle that in any way. That's a huge breakthrough uh, within the eye world. Um, but it's interesting, over the last six months or so, and, and maybe I'd be interested in other people's uh, experiences also, we're hearing more and more about stem cell therapy and also gene therapy. And I just have this feeling that that's really, we're at the, at the, at the cusp of a new wave that's starting uh, for gene therapy and stem cell therapy. And I think we're understanding better some of the parameters within the eye and how well suited the eye is for those uh, treatments. They've been very eloquently outlined earlier. So I think that's really the, the new wave as far as I see it, and I think that the eye meetings are reflecting that already now. Your, your perspective? So, um, so indeed, we've seen this move as well. Um, also because gene or cell therapy addresses um, a higher complexity about the disease biology as compared to monoclonal antibodies as compared to small molecules. So the, the promise is, is uh, bigger. And also there is now the most advanced gene therapy uh, product in, in the field is the, the one from Sparks Therapeutics that is in phase three. And we will have the phase three readouts next year. We've seen promising results in phase two. We've seen patients um, showing improvement of vision. Um, so I think this will be an important signal for, for the entire field. Okay. Pete, from your perspective? I hate making predictions these <laughs> days. Um, uh, I think there's a major problem in cell therapies, which is the phase trial process itself, which basically 
creates a problem for probably the majority of people here today in terms of investors, which is a phase one in a pharmaceutical is on a normal population and immediately you get readout in terms of its safety. The next phase is going into a clinical population in which you will get efficacy. And I think the problem for the cell therapy and the gene therapy is we can't have that phase one. So the phase two really is a safety trial. And this is one of the issues, dependent on the clinical population that you may go in. There are ways of, especially in the eye, of um, um, actually making that um, a difference. So I think what we've seen in the eye in terms of cell therapies should make us comfortable that both gene and cell therapy are safe. And I think this next year, we either make it or we don't in terms of gene and cell therapy, which is the readout has to be justifiable efficacy due to the actual therapeutic. And I think my prediction for the new year is that 2015, the end of, not the beginning and not the middle, and not the, but the end of 2015, we will finally, from ophthalmology, get a readout in efficacy. Last word to you, Jose Well, going back uh, records for one year, uh, over a year, you, you, just in terms of publications, both in cell therapy, in uh, gene therapy, and uh, in artificial retina, we have seen a tremendous amount of data accumulating, showing that these therapies are coming of age, early results. Uh, the first reimbursement for prosthetics in the, UK, in the US, in France now, uh, showing that the economical model is starting to be validated, even the costly model is starting to be validated. Early results from cell therapy, which are just showing safety at this stage, but so important that we, we are safe with that, especially some trials where concerning for a lot of us and no, nothing wrong happened, which is great. And uh, gene, many gene therapy trials are ongoing currently in our centers, in several centers in the world. So it's very promising, but we are now waiting for the confirmation stage, which is improvement in function, stabilization of function, and uh, maybe a late 15 or maybe later, uh, we will have that. The important aspect also is that it's no longer going to be only a biological approach, it's going to be also a computerized approach with a lot of uh, data being processed to be sent, uh, talking, for example, about optogenetics, which is in a gene therapy area where we are very much involved. We need a lot of processing of that, and uh, we are no longer to be in a secluded area with biologics on one side and the prosthetics on the other side, just to take uh, that into account, or connected medicine. All of this is merging into a global approach uh, of well, thank you. And with that, um, I hope you've got in a, our brief time together uh, an up-to-the-moment the, up uh, analysis of where things are in cell and gene therapy in ophthalmology. Can I thank the panel and encourage you to go in the lifts upstairs for lunch on time? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.